The Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Family Theater, starring Lee Bowman and Frank McHugh. George Murphy is your host. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Good evening, this is George Murphy as your host of Family Theater tonight. I want to welcome all of our new listeners and say thank you to all of the old friends whose loyalty and word-of-mouth enthusiasm for our program and its purposes have helped us to grow tremendously. Family Theater, as you know, is dedicated to a purpose, a purpose no one can quarrel with, a happy family. We number quite a few million now, and that's an encouraging note. It means that all of you join with us in the belief that a happy family is not only our most precious possession, but is also the very foundation of the peace and understanding which is needed in the community, the nation, and the world today. We also share the simple conviction that prayer, family prayer, can help keep our families well and happy, can help keep our homes together. For a family that prays together stays together. And now it's time for our play. Tonight, Family Theater presents an original story entitled A Bunch of Keys, written by Bud Lesser and starring two of your favorites, Lee Bowman and Frank McHugh. I'm the proprietor of the only decent eating place in Barston. So naturally, I know most everyone in town. Oh, a few people try Miss Madigan's once in a while. But they get tired of the tea room whipped cream goo. So they come back to Jimmy. That's me. Oh, you wanted to know about Joel Hammond. Well, it's an interesting story. I can't tell you the ending because the ending hasn't been lived yet. But I can tell you quite a bit about the beginning. It was one of those warm spring mornings that makes you glad you're alive. Only the down-and-outer who stood in front of my place wasn't interested in the weather, or life, or anything, but the aroma of the coffee I was making. I was about to go out and tell him to come in and have a cup on the management when that Louise McGowan came along. You know, that cute little girl with the big eyes. She had her head buried in the morning paper as she rounded the corner. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't see you. I guess I... Oh, that's, that's all right. You don't weigh very much. Oh, I guess that's because I dash around so much. Oh. Is uh, Jimmy's open? Yeah. Can't you smell the coffee? Mm, yeah, and I do need a cup. Well, sorry I charged into you. I'll be sick. Hey, uh, wouldn't you like a cup of coffee? Uh, thanks, uh, but uh, I just uh, just had one down the block aways. There isn't any restaurant down the block aways. Oh, come on. I do owe you a cup of coffee at least. Why, you could sue me for dangerous walking. Come on now. I've been down on my luck, too. I tell you what, you can sit at the other end of the counter if I'm not your type. I'd love a cup of coffee. And I'd like to sit beside you if you don't mind. I haven't talked to anyone in almost a week. Good morning, Louise. Hi, Jimmy. I brought you another customer. You know, you should be paying me a commission. Uh, let's see. Orange juice, toast, and coffee for me. And he'll have the same, plus some ham and eggs. Double order. I, I, I really shouldn't Look, let let's, you... Uh, let's sit in the booth. We'll have more room to spread out the paper in case we want to read. But they didn't want to read. Either of them. Louise is the sort who likes to know what makes people tick. And to tell you the truth, I was pretty curious about this stranger myself. You could see he hadn't been a bum for too long. And I sort of took my time getting their breakfast ready. And when I finally got back to the booth, he was talking. Opening up like a man who's lived with himself too long. And as he poured out his heart, my little beanery became the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Things were popping on the exchange that afternoon he was telling about. It was a frenzy of buying and selling. 
Joel Hammond stood by his post, tossing his bunch of keys into the air and catching them again as they thudded against the heel of his hand. This key business used to serve as a sort of a barometer. And some of the other traders used it in buying and selling. But that day, the keys went up and down at a mile a minute clip. The wise boys knew there was trouble in the air. This is Hammond. Put me through to my office, please. Harry? It's taken another tumble. I'll need some help. Nope, the bottom's out of industrial, too. I'll have to call on Lester and you, too. Oh? Oh, I see. Of course I understand. Hammond again. Will you get my fiancé for me on the phone? It's Plaza 3... Yeah, that's right. Three more points. Hello? Hello? May I speak to Miss Richmond, please? Oh, Violet. I didn't recognize your voice. Uh, Violet, things have gone a little sour here. I'm afraid I'll have to borrow those bonds I gave you last week to hold for me. No, no, not yet. But if I can't raise some big money in a hurry... Oh, oh, I see. It wouldn't be convenient for me to be washed up either. Well, it's, it's nice to know the score, Violet. Never mind, then. Have a nice time at the party, dear. Alex! Alex, uh... I won't be needing this key. Will you see that it's turned in at the exchange office? Here, for your trouble. I'm not that broke. Oh, uh, Miss Emerson. Yes? Is Mr. Finch around? Oh, no, Mr. Hammond. He left the office. They've all gone. I, uh, I could have guessed it. Miss Emerson, I, uh, I won't be around for a while. Someone might like an extra key. The cleaning woman, maybe. Here. The bunch of keys were still being tossed in the air as Joel took the elevator down. And he walked out of the office building for the last time. When Joel arrived at the Lido Club to clean out his locker... He found the usual assortment of slacks and sweaters and gadgets in addition to his golf clubs, things you might find in any locker in any given club. But they represented something very real to Joel Hammond. They represented his acceptance. His reputation on the street was enough to get him by at the Lido Club, but the camaraderie of the 19th hole was over now. Oh, Joel. Uh, Joel, glad I saw you. I was going to phone Radar foursome's off for the weekend. Oh? Oh, that's too bad. Yes, I have a client coming in from out of town, and, well, I promised him a game when he got here. Fred and Sam will want to come along, I know. He's a fraternity brother. Well, that's all right, Art. I think I may be out of town anyway. I wanted to talk to you about something, though. Oh, sorry, Joel. The gang's waiting for me on the first tee. Could we talk it over the first of the week or sometime? You don't have to worry, Art. I just wanted to give you that iron you always had a hankering for. Oh, Thanks. But uh, just by luck, I stumbled across one at Spaulding's yesterday. Almost exactly like it. Uh, thanks awfully, awfully, though. Uh, be seeing you. The habits of years are not easily broken. Joel went out of the clubhouse tossing his bunch of keys into the air, apparently unmindful of the fact that the bunch had been reduced from six to two in a few hectic hours. And all you have to say to me is that you're busy tonight and you'd like to talk it over in the morning? Oh, I'm really frightfully sorry, Joel. I, I made the date with the Creightons ages ago. Oh, you're usually busy on Thursday nights, and I know you can't abide the Creightons, I've so managed I... to survive several evenings with them over the past few years. All right, then, Joel. If you won't let me be nice about it, the Creightons wouldn't welcome you. Everyone in my circle knows by this time that you were washed up this afternoon. Now they're saying, what could Violet Richmond ever have seen in that big farmer with the loud suits? Violet, I got rid of the suits you didn't like three weeks after we met. And I got rid of that loud car you didn't like this afternoon. That too, Joel. Oh, I'm really sorry. Sorry enough to marry me and go away somewhere? Make a new start? Mm, let's not make a scene, Joel. Well, there were times when I thought we you might... You had money and I was willing to help you spend it. But you're still a Horatio Alger farm boy under that pinstripe. And if I wouldn't marry you then, I certainly wouldn't now. Well, there's no denying your honesty. I'm sorry I held you up. I'm going up to the lodge until I can figure this all out. 
And, uh, oh yes, give the Creightons my love. Joel Hammond left for New England the next day. All that was left of the past hung on his keychain. It was the key that opened his country lodge. The big rambling place came alive as Louise made Joel tell her about it between mouthfuls of ham and eggs. And you could hear something of how he died there, a little at a time. I didn't do much of anything there, but I kept telling myself that this was what I needed. Mm. Long walks, hours in front of the fireplace, an occasional trip to the village for food. You uh, cooked it yourself? Oh, I let the caretaker go the first day. It took almost my last dollar to pay him off. Oh, and after that, you were completely alone? For a month. Uh, maybe more. I didn't keep track of the time. I slept a lot. When I slept, I didn't think so much. And uh, then I had a visitor. Oh? He brought me a letter. A letter about an engagement present. Who was the letter from? Well, it was signed by a lawyer, but it was really from Violet. It tied the pink ribbon on the whole situation. I see. She wanted something, but you had nothing left, huh? Just the lodge. I still have the letter. Right here. It makes nice reading. This communication will serve to inform you that the country lodge now being occupied by you was purchased in 1943 and in accordance with your instructions was registered under the name of Miss Violet Richmond. She has informed me that she has sold aforementioned property and since the new owners desire occupancy at an early date... But she so, couldn't do that. I left that very day. The place held no refuge. No peace for me anymore. What could I do? I studied the want ads at night, but no one advertised for an ex-boy wonder of Wall Street. But, Joel, your experience in business must have been worth something. Oh, sure, sure. Talented fourth at golf, second at gin rummy and night clubbing. Desires responsible position where he can lose his employer's money as rapidly as he lost his own. With that attitude, you couldn't possibly get or hold a job. Oh, oh, I tried things to build up my morale. Liquor, a book on how to be a success, copying some of the easy come, easy go boys I bumped into in my wanderings. I really tried to shake this thing, but I couldn't. This morning I've really hit bottom. I'm accepting charity, a handout. And from a woman. Now I've tried everything. No, not everything. Oh, so now I get the lecture. Now I'm told that I needed a good woman, or religion, or faith in God, or something. You filled my belly, and now you can save my soul. You'll get a special merit badge in the Girl Guides, or you can tell your Sunday school class how you saved a sinner. I'm much too busy to save your soul. Here, Jimmy, I'll be seeing you. Oh, I... I... I, I'm sorry. I was very rude, wasn't I? Yes, yes, you were. But I understand. And you won't rush off for another moment? Oh, I really have to. I wanted to get to the office early so I could leave in time to get my apartment cleaned up. Well, well, uh, why, why don't you let me do that? Oh. oh, it would be a way of paying you back for breakfast. Oh, I wouldn't think of letting you... No, no, I, I, I mean it. I'd like to do it. Oh. It's more than just paying you back for breakfast. I'd, I'd like to polish the stove and scrub the floors until they shine. I'd, I'd like to lose myself in a sea of soap suds. I'd like to show you that I could... All right, it's a deal. The apartment is down the side street around the corner. 331 Maple, apartment 30. Oh, uh, here's the key. You can bring it back to Jimmy when you're through. Oh. You really need a job, fella. I haven't got a nickel. Well, I can use a helper. Could you wash dishes? Maybe do a little light cooking? You know, fry an egg, maybe fill the coffee urns. I think I could. But I've got to clean that young lady's apartment first. I promised her. I could come in late this afternoon. Oh, I don't need you in the afternoons. Suppose you start tomorrow morning. You clean the place up, get the coffee started, maybe wait on a few early birds before I get here. Oh, you know how those coffee urns work? Yeah, I, I watched you through the window this morning. Well, then you're all set. Oh, uh, you'll find a razor and a clean apron in the back room when you get here. You'll be opening up, so you'll need my extra key. Here, catch. Atta boy. Hey, you ought to be playing for the Dodgers. He didn't hear my last great witticism. He was looking around the counter for something. He found it at last. A small piece of twine from one of the sugar sacks I'd been emptying. 
He took his two keys, that's the one to Louise's apartment, the one to my beanery, and he tied them together. He was tossing them up in the air. <laughs> well, he wasn't exactly a personality kid with the customers that first morning. But he did his chores well. And with a shave and a white apron, he wasn't a bad-looking guy. He seemed to sort of relieve the tension by tossing his two keys in the air. He'd given Louise's key back, of course. But he had a key to a room down the street where he'd gotten on my say-so. And Louise came in to thank him the next day. Morning, Jimmy. Morning, Joel. Good morning, Louise. Hi, Louise. The usual? Huh? The usual. The usual, Joel. Orange juice, toast, and coffee coming up. Uh, is this stool on your station, my good man? I do so like to have my favorite waiter to take care of me. Here you are. I made the coffee. Mmm, smells good. <laughs> you know, I really had time to fix my own breakfast this morning, but... Well, I wanted to come in and thank you for the job you did in my apartment. It hasn't looked like that since I moved in. And where did you find those flowers? Um... Oh, they, uh, well, they were growing in that empty lot on the corner. Oh. You're getting better. You have keys. Is that what's done? In a way. And I know that I'm better than I've been in months. But I'm not kidding myself. I know that I won't be, well, back to normal until I have my bunch of keys again. Oh. Keys that open the doors to the things I didn't have as a kid. All men are created free and equal, it says here. But they don't stay free and equal. They have to fight for the things that make people say, there goes Joel Hammond. He just bought a home on the Riviera. He's always at first nights and Mondays at the opera, the polo games and the horse shows. I've never seen a play, much less a first night. But I know what you mean. We have fun here in Boston, though. We have two picture houses. Joel and Louise took in both the Orpheum and the Bijou that week. And he continued to work for me. After that tirade the first morning, he seemed to settle down to his new job. Assistant to the owner of a beanery in a one-horse town. And then suddenly, after a few months, he quit. He didn't say why. I didn't ask. But I had an idea. He'd gotten a chance to add another key to his new bunch. Well, here I am, Mr. Bryant. Which is my desk. Your desk? <laughs> the whole shebang is yours. You're the manager. Well, I, I, I'm sorry to seem like an ingrate, Mr. Bryant, but uh, this whole thing doesn't make sense. You offer me a job as a real estate salesman at twice what I was getting at Jimmy's, and, and now you tell me that I'm the manager of the whole outfit? I liked your manner the first time I laid eyes on you, and I have confidence that you can make money for both of us. The salary is only a starter. All right, all right, go ahead. I, I need money. I have to have it if I'm going to get where I expect to go, again. But I have to know the setup. Why did you pick a town like Barston? What made you select the assistant hash slinger in a lunchroom as your prize salesman? Oh, get off your high horse, Hammond. Uh, Joe. The deal's on the level, but I'm not making any claim to being a philanthropist. I'm a businessman. Yeah, I know you built that swell new house way out near the airport. But you, you wouldn't need a salesman to sell that house in these times. I'm going to build 500 of those houses, Joe, my boy. And I'm going to rent them to veterans at low rents. And they'll fill up in a hurry. Well, they sure will. Veterans need homes. But you say you're a businessman, and there isn't much profit in becoming a one-man veterans housing committee. Where's this big profit? <laughs> Gad, you are a suspicious soul, and I'm glad you are. This way you'll be able to answer others when they put these questions. The deal is simple. With 500 new families moving into an undeveloped community, there's a great opening for the local businessmen. The project will need markets and hardware stores, maybe a movie house, even a restaurant, or any number of things. It'll be a little city all by itself. Yeah, where, where does the profit come in? I've bought all the property around there. Got it for a song. And we're going to sell it at a very handsome profit. Hmm. Sounds good. Well, where do I fit in? Oh, you've met most of the local businessmen since you've been working at Jimmy's. And, uh, and they like you, according to all I hear. You've got to sell them on the idea of helping us help them make Barston grow. I couldn't do it, and maybe you can't either. <laughs> They're suspicious of anyone who hasn't lived in the town for at least 25 years. Ah, but if you were to sell Jimmy the idea of becoming the president of our community plan, uh, they might go for it, eh? The folks in this town think a lot of him. He gets the credit for providing homes for 500 veterans and a new center for profitable stores. And I sell a lot of land I got cheap at a real profit. I'm figuring you in for half. <laughs> Ah, 
I bought the first lot. As a site from a new restaurant. Ah, oh, Joel was busy. Talking to the town's big money. Almost every night. You'd be helping the Veterans Committee and yourself at the same time, Mr. Schmidt. They have to have a meat market. Jimmy sees things our way, Mr. Gardner, and there'll be lots of kids who'll need new shoes in the new project. Yeah, yeah, Jimmy. Jimmy bought the first lot. But we'll need a drugstore, too, Mr. Skinner. I don't think the soda fountain will hurt Jimmy's business too much. A furniture store? Should do well, Mr. Levy. You'll also be giving the vets a hand in building up the community. By the end of November, the project was really set. I'd started building, so had half a dozen others. Aside from that imposing first sample house, things were going slowly across the boulevard from the store property. Oh, we know it was tough to get enough material for 500 homes, and Bryant kept running down to the city in quest of building material. Oh, Joel was as busy as a bee. Naturally, he didn't have a great deal of time for Louise, but he certainly never looked at another girl in town. No, sir. Louise was for him, all right. Ah, oh, gee, it's good to see you smiling, Joel. I'm glad the project's really going over. Even if it has meant that I haven't seen so much of you lately. Well, it's, it's just about wound up now. And when the last deal's made, I kiss little old Boston goodbye. Oh. <laughs> Baby, don't look like that. When I leave here, I want you with me. As my wife. I'm going to take the money I made here, and I'm going to hit the street again. And I'll hold on to it this time. And you'll have everything you ever wanted. A big house. Servants. A limousine a block and a half long. A home on the Riviera. First nights at the theater. Yes, Louise. No, Joel. No, those are the things you want. Well, everyone wants those things. That's what we all work for. What else is there? The things your New York friends would probably call corny. The respect and friendship of your neighbors. People like Jimmy. The peace and self-understanding that can come only through simple prayer. A love for each other that doesn't depend on cars or mansions. Louise. Louise, you, you don't understand. You know, I thought at first you were finding your way to these things. But you aren't working for the veterans, Joel. You're working for money. You want to get back to Wall Street. You want revenge. I knew there was something wrong. They stopped seeing each other. Joel went ahead with his recreational center deal as though it were the only thing in the world that mattered. I found out later that he was planning on spending Christmas in New York. It was the day before Christmas when he finally closed the sale. Here it is, Mr. Bryant. Cash on the line for the last piece of property. And I've got all the rest of the money here. We've split two ways, like I said. Cash on the line, that's Bryant. Thanks, Mr. Bryant. You won't be needing me here anymore, so I'm leaving for New York tonight. I wish you luck with the project. Oh, <laughs> are you kidding? Well, I'll be on the same train. Oh, swell. Gonna spend the holidays in the big town? Oh, I'll spend more than that, I guess. Easy come, easy go. If I never see this burg again, it'll be okay with me. Yeah, but the houses, you can't mean that. I'm not putting up any houses in this one-horse town. I got my profit. Let Jimmy and his pals build the homes if they want them. Why, Bryant, that's fraud. You can't get oh, away. Oh, take it easy, Hammond. We're within our legal rights... I sold property that belonged to me. I just happened to change my mind about the veterans' homes. I found out that material was too tough to get or something. You can't do that to the people here, to the veterans. Oh, now, don't pull any hero stuff on me. You pulled plenty of shenanigans when you were on Wall Street. Oh, yeah, I knew who you were when I saw you working in that beanery. And I wasn't kidding you any either. You knew what we were doing. I didn't know. But everyone here will think I did. Ah, but you won't be here. Oh, yes, I will. I decided to stay in Boston. I'm going to face this thing out. And you're staying here too, Brian. Now, listen, Hammond, you've got a safe out. Look, no one's going to blame you for all this. Jimmy's the president of the Boston Helps Her Veterans Committee. He thought up that swell-sounding title. He was the one who vouched for the outfit. He was the one who got the town council to put the official stamp on it. Let him take the rap. Why, you <laughs> dirty chiseler. Oh! You, you, you can't get away with this, you, you cheap hero. Hand over that cash, Bryant. Thanks. That money is going into the bank tonight going to be used to build these homes. You'll get your share of the rents whether you stick around or go. Frankly, I don't care what you do. Merry Christmas, Mr. Bryant. Here 
Evening, Jimmy. Hi, Joe. Hey, what happened? I had a fight with my conscience. Do I look all right, Jimmy? You look better than I've ever seen you look before, Joel. I, uh, I went to Louise's before I came here. She isn't home. You wouldn't know where I could find her, would you? Christmas Eve? She's probably in church. Thanks, Jimmy. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. Hey, look, if you aren't doing anything tomorrow... See you I'll... later, Jimmy. Louise. Oh, Joel. Louise, I'm here to stay. I, I found out that... Oh, that all those things I thought I wanted shh, again. Shh. Just, just hold my hand, darling. Services are And Christmas over. has, for too long, represented material things to many. Our lives are enriched not by presents nor possessions, but by a full understanding of our own souls and of the real values of this world. If you have this understanding, you will have no difficulty finding the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Merry Christmas, and God bless you. This is George Murphy again, and I know I'm speaking for all of you when I express my thanks to Lee Bowman and Frank McHugh for telling us the story of A Bunch of Keys. The story which seems to prove that the key to happiness is not always made of metal. You know, every one of you listening in has a story of your own. One that's still being written. The story of your life. And the wonderful stories, those you can be proud of, are probably not at all unusual. They're about a boy and a girl who got married, stayed married, and raised a happy family. Now, if that's your story, you're pretty lucky, and you know it. Because keeping a family together and happy isn't always easy. Raising kids the right way isn't always easy. But then, anyone in his right mind knows that nothing worth having comes easy. Keeping a family together and happy is an uphill fight. Problems all the way. Grant it. But remember, you don't have to climb that hill by yourself. Have you ever thought of asking for help? Ask God's help. Ask and ye shall receive. You know that. No family is so self-sufficient that it can ignore God. There's no problem so big that it can't be solved with God's help. So pray. Pray together with your family. Thank God for what you have and ask him for what you need. Do that and you take the biggest step you've ever taken towards one of the most wonderful things in life, a happy family. Before saying goodnight, I want to express our thanks to all of you who have helped make this program possible. Thanks also to Mel Williamson for directing our play tonight and to our producer, Bob Longnecker. Next week, our stars on the Family Theater will be Mr. Charles Boyer, and Miss Ethel Barrymore, and the Mitchell Boys Choir in a special Easter week show. Now, this is George Murphy saying goodnight. This series of the Family Theater broadcast is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the actors and technicians in the motion picture and radio industries who have volunteered their services to fulfill it. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.